Welcome back. You're watching the news tonight. Well, are you worried over your lost or stolen mobile phone and pondering over what to do and how to track it? Well, here is a chance for you to take control of the situation now. All that you have to do is to inst install an anti-theft software that provides features to lock the cell phone located and to even wipe its data. Cell Sniper, an upgraded application to track a stolen mobile handset, was launched in Chennai this morning. Now you can start spying your stolen mobile with Salim, our crime reporter. This man is a technology enthusiast himself and he suddenly realized that his expensive mobile phone was missing. Though a bit worried, he was confident of tracing it because the phone had an anti-theft software. Well, using another mobile phone, he not only found the missing mobile, but also the thief. One can trace. A trace is a very important feature. Now, normally, whenever it sits on the phone, one can just send a normal SMS, so it will respond you back with the you know, current location. This is how it's going to help. Cell Sniper is an advanced anti-theft software for mobile phones. It works on the Symbian operating system. A text message sent to the missing phone deletes all information stored by its owner and receives the details about the phone's location, cell ID and country ID. The anti-theft software also allows access to calls and messages made from the lost phone, which helps to get information about its illegal user, track the phone's movements and even lock it remotely. Though the software appears to be useful, experts say its success depends on its pricing. Advanced anti-theft softwares unfortunately are not for free. But with consumer expectations on low price to solutions, pricing would definitely make a difference to the way a product is received. In Chennai, Salim for NDTV Hindu. Well, on to some news from the business sector now. Well, all big and small garment retailers, wholesalers and manufacturing units will be closed throughout the country on the 7th of March to oppose the excise duty of 10% that has been imposed on them. They will be going on a peace rally in Chennai tomorrow in support of their cause. And on to some news from the international quarters now. While well, NDTV has been reporting on the situation within Libya, its impact on oil and the evacuation of Indians. Now, with 18,000 Indians in the country, it's a massive task. The passenger ship Scotia Prince has reached Benghazi and it's expected to carry over 1,000 citizens back to India, waiting for over 10 days now. Now, here is a report how an Indian school principal is helping embassy officials to get these Indians back to safety. In peacetime, it is the export of oil that keeps the harbour in Benghazi bustling and busy. Today, in strife torn Libya, there is no oil going out, but there is still a sea of people in search of an exit. Among them are thousands of Indians for whom Libya was home. They are now waiting for a second homecoming. It's at this port that this Quersha prince has arrived to ferry its second batch of Indian evacuees. Some have been here for 10 days, preferring the comfort of the crowd, even strangers, to the fierce fighting they have left behind. Supervising the evacuation on an early weekend morning is this 49-year-old school principal, originally from Gorakhpur in Uttar Pradesh. As the Indian government continues to evacuate its citizens from the war-torn country of Libya, we come across Tabassum Mansoor, an Indian expat settled in Libya for the past 15 years, who has single-handedly charted out an evacuation plan for more than 2,500 Indians stuck in Libya. Foreign ministry officials, who themselves have now spent a fortnight working round the clock, say that getting Indians out of here would have been impossible without Tabassum Mansoor. With phone and internet services down, the main nightmare for evacuation plans has been the lack of communication. It was very easier for me to get the information regarding passport numbers and all we could get through internet but it was totally jammed and we could not. Crises have a way of making borders irrelevant. 
Many fleeing Indians tell the story of how they were given shelter by Pakistanis they did not even know. Tabassum Mansoor is married to a Pakistani and even as she sends people home, like a mother sending her kids to safety, neither her nor her husband have any plans of leaving. With many Indians still stuck in the interiors of Libya, for these Indians going home, Tabassum Mansoor is a godsend and the kindness of strangers is enough to be grateful for. With Manoj Thakur and Ruby Dhingra in Benghazi, Prachi Bucha for NDTV. Now is India on the wrong side of the history as far as Libya is concerned? Talking to NDTV Sonia Singh, the Foreign Secretary Nirupama Rao says no, India should be concerned about its own interests before taking a hard stand on the developments in any Arab country. Taking what happened in Egypt recently as well, where you had some criticism that India was slow, they didn't see the writing on the wall regarding the Mubarak regime. And in fact, quoting a cartoon I just saw in The Economist where they had the Russian and Chinese president saying, we will not condemn the heinous crimes of Colonel Gaddafi. And the next cartoon says, because who knows when we may need to use these heinous crimes ourselves. Now, of course, that's The Economist, so it's a completely different viewpoint. But is India running the risk of being on the wrong side of history? taking both the Egypt examples and Gaddafi, where we may react or say, oh, with, uh, welcome a dictator going, but when it's too late or when we're not taking the lead in it. I think we should see it through our prism mm -hmm. and we should be guided by our interest and our, you know, assessments of, these situ of such situations. Can you tell me which government, which government in the world was able to forecast or to foretell mm -hmm. what was going to happen in the Arab world? I think the whole turn of events came suddenly mm -hmm. and it came like a huge outpouring, a huge, you know, a tidal wave, as it were, of protests. It took some time for us to make our judgments about this. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we were on the wrong side of history. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Egyptian government and the Indian government, uh, the new government, we have very good relations. I was with, I had an ex excellent meeting with the Egyptian ambassador yesterday and mm -hmm. we were exchanging notes about the situation mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, how they saw it and how we looked at it. So, you know, we have a very time-tested relationship with countries like Egypt. Sure. It's not going to be shaken, you know, mm -hmm. by, by what has happened recently. Moving on, Indian defense scientists today took an important step in developing a credible ballistic missile defense system for the country with a successful test of an advanced air defense, which is AAD interceptor missile. The test was conducted at the integrated test range in Chandipur in Orissa this morning. The interceptor launched from the Wheeler Island in Orissa successfully destroyed a modified Prithvi missile posing as a hostile enemy missile 16 kilometers above the sea level. This was the fifth test of the interceptor missile. Now, as the Supreme Court is set to deliver its verdict on whether Aruna Shanbagh should be allowed to live or die, the nurses who have been involved in her care for over three decades now speak out for the first time on camera. They say as long as Aruna has people to care for her, she should be allowed to live. I, I don't want her to be killed like this. A plea for Aruna's life from an old friend. Sister Pramila Kushe, now 80, was at KEM hospital when Aruna was attacked 37 years ago and was among the first to see her that terrible morning. Aruna was there in sitting position, chain around her neck. Her tears were running from the eyes, really speaking. And her lips were just as if she wanted to say something. But she, no word was coming out. It's KEM hospital's nurses that have lovingly cared for Aruna for over three decades. They take pride in the fact that she never had any bed sores. In fact, in the past, when one dean moved her to another hospital, the nurses struck work to bring her back. Matron Durga Mehta was among those who cared for Aruna for 20 years before retiring. She voices what the nurses feel. Despite her vegetative state, Aruna can still communicate and respond in her own way. I talk to her, Aruna, how are you? She just looks, she can't talk, so she just makes no... Uh, and as soon as the one food is taken to the mouth, she used to open the mouth. Almost every nurse at KEM hospital has been put on Aruna's caretaking duty one time or the other in her career. Hence, they now all feel personally involved as they wait for the verdict. 
under strict instructions from hospital authorities not to speak to the media. All they can do now is hope for the best silently. In Mumbai, Prachi Zawdekar Vag for NDTV. Moving on, the youngest of the Gandhis, BJP MP Varun Gandhi, has married his graphic designer fiancé, Yamini Roy Chaudhary, in Varanasi. Family members from both the sides attended the pre-wedding rituals and a simple ceremony at a wedding held this morning. Varun had invited his cousins Priyanka and Rahul and Aunt Sonia Gandhi for the ceremony, but no one from Sonia Gandhi's family were present there. This is the first wedding in the family after Priyanka's marriage. Well, the Indians are not taking their minerals for granted and the island team is just moving by. The latest from the World Cup is coming up.